While the 2020 general election might seem far away, we've kept our eyes on the polls lately to gaze the Democratic primary race and voter sentiment surrounding the election. But 2016 left a lot of Americans shook as then-candidate Donald Trump won the presidential election against Hillary Clinton, one of the biggest upsets in American history. So today we want to discuss what happened with polling in 2016, what changes have been made, and can we trust the polls going into 2020? Joining us today are our polling experts, Lee Maringoff, director of the Mayor's Poll, and Terrence Woodbury, partner of Hit Strategies. All right, guys, thank you two for being here. Thanks, uh, we're going to just jump right in. And Lee, I'm going to start off with you. Sure. First of all, I'm going to give you a chance because you guys just put out some new polling with yep. NPR this sure. week. Yep. And tell us what you found. Well, I mean, I think there's lots going on on the impeachment side, not much going on there, a lot, lot going on in the real world, but not in the public opinion arena. Uh, nothing's really changed, still pretty much an even split. Uh, in terms of the Democratic primary sweepstakes, uh, we're seeing uh, a little bit more of uh, Bernie Sanders in our numbers. Numbers than others have been showing, and I think that's in part because no one's paying much attention to him right now, and I right. think that's part of what's going on. So we're going to see, you know, this is still going to shake out. We know from prior examples, prior uh, election cycles, that a lot still happens in Iowa and New Hampshire between now and then. So some of these early polls that have been going on for months and months and months help get you into the debates, but don't necessarily tell you what's going to happen in these primary states. Right. You know, one of the things, Terrence, that we see a lot, or we see these polls that are giving us a big general election number, and then there are the polls that give us what's happening in states. Mm -hmm. Which one should we be paying attention to? I mean, the, the, the early states, the early state polling has such an impact on how the rest of the country is, is, is viewing this race. Um, and and as, far as, as far as you can gain some momentum in New Hampshire and in, in Iowa, South Carolina and Nevada, the rest of the country pays attention to that. The same way, uh, the same way as, as they begin to vote, the country begins to begins to swing in line at, with, with with the results and, of what's happening. Yeah, and no, and, and no Democrats gotten to the nomination without winning either Iowa or New Hampshire. So well, Bill Clinton didn't the, win. That, New Hampshire. That, that's the asterisk, right? <laughs> Iowa didn't it just count. felt like it. Right? Iowa didn't count. The comeback hit. <laughs> that's, that's right. just, yeah, Iowa didn't count because of Tom Harkin and. He sort of won New Hampshire by losing New Hampshire. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the questions, which is where candidates place in the order sure. also matters, That's right? Exactly so you take right. a look at somebody like Vice President Biden, yeah. who is dominating in the national polls, has been from the moment he got yeah. in the That's race. Right. But he's been kind of up and down in the early states of Iowa and New Hampshire, but he's always dominated in South Carolina. So people say, oh, well, if he can live through Iowa and New Hampshire, he'll make it to South Carolina, and that might be the backstop. But these things aren't happening in isolation. That's right. No. People in South Carolina are going to pay attention to what happens in Iowa and New yeah, Hampshire. which is why uh, Michael Bloomberg, who's playing the, you know, the eighth inning strategy, he wants the four to take place and then jump in on Super Tuesday. That may look good now, but it may not look so great down the road. When, but yeah. has that ever worked? I mean, people have tried this before, well, right? President Giuliani. <laughs> right. Or Wesley Clark, who's the guy I worked for, who tried something similar President and that Clark, didn't work. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough because, as Terrence was saying, I mean, those people early... Those early events really get a lot of attention, That's right. uh, as Donald Trump did uh, four years ago in the, uh, in, in, in the early rounds. But, Terrence, should we be paying attention to any of this stuff? I mean, 2016, as we started out, 2016 kind of snake bit everybody, and people are feeling like, wait a minute, do, po does, do polling, does polling even matter All right. anymore? I got I to gotta, I gotta defend my industry a bit here, okay? Yeah. Okay, because, because I mean, in, in 2016, quite frankly, the polls weren't that far off, there right? You we, go. We, have to talk, <laughs> we have to talk a lot about how the polls are being reported in the media. There you uh, go. As opposed to what, the, as to what the poll results were. <laughs> okay. and, and far too often, we saw the media reporting a two-person race, and in the real world, this was not a two-person race. That's right. And when you and when you and when you include the the the, fa the third-party factor, we actually saw Hillary polling at 47, 48 percent. Well, Hillary finished at 48 yeah. percent. Well, you know what's funny is I had conversations back when I was just a you know political pundit floating around the table nets. <laughs> I would have conversations with hosts of shows yeah. saying, "You gotta ask the ballot." question right. because I okay. keep hearing from Democrats okay. who are not firmly in one camp or another. They are not just okay. thinking about Hillary. That's they exactly might be right. thinking about somebody yeah, else. Yeah, right. but no, let me uh, jump in on that, and I agree with what Terrence was and saying. the ballot have four names on it. Yes. Four That's big right. names. And, and, and in some right. states, like in 2000, that made with Ralph Nader, that made a big it difference when you're talking right. about you know, 10,000 votes, 11,000 right. yeah. 11, votes. Look, and I think also we have to clarify, from an industry standpoint, the national polls were pretty much right on. There wasn't a problem with that. The state polls, the ones who stopped early early before the Comey famous uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> dictum mm -hmm. there. Uh, look, we know from the exit polls that it closed the undecided. If That's you right. dislike Trump, if you dislike Clinton, you moved Clinton's way. And the whole, I mean, you moved Trump's way. And the whole perception out there that, uh, that uh, you know, 
Donald Trump was you know, going to lose and Hillary was a 92% chance of winning. That was really done by these aggregators. And they weren't doing polls. They were looking at the polls, putting their special sauce on and sort of 96%, 91%. And they really weren't dealing okay, with the uncertainty. This is good. Of that. This is good. Yeah. Let's talk about the aggregators for a minute, sure. because this is something that's popped up in the last maybe I don't know about ten years. Yeah. Five oh yeah. Well, it, it hasn't started, been that long, right? It started with Nate Silver in five thirty eight, and, and, and since then, um, and then everybody right. last time got one too. So you got was out there. So, yeah. HuffPo was yeah. out there. So are right. they any good? Because what I was taught about polling, what I was taught about polling, both from you know just being around politics for a long time, is you want to look at one poll and track the progress exactly. over time that's with right. that poll. It's hard to compare different polls polls with each other because the methodology is so yeah. That's exactly right. And that's, and that's, that's the danger of, of aggregating, right, it's, is that you lose that trend line, right? And, and even when you look at the primary right now, it's less important when I look at a snapshot of where they are today as it is when I look at how they've been trending mm -hmm. over the last six months. Sure. And aggregation sometimes loses that. Yeah. So we have to be able to pay attention, not just the to where they are, but where they are. Right, because the movements are so small in an aggregator. That's you might exactly see somebody right. move 0.4%. percent that, not only, that could matter. Yeah, and not only is the quality of the different polls being thrown together in one big stew, you know, you're dealing with some polls might have been done two weeks ago, and they're mm -hmm. still in the mix. And that may work or may not work, but if we have a case like 2016 where there's late action, you know, the pollsters jump in on this early. The electorate sometimes doesn't get in until the yeah. eighth or ninth inning, and if that's the case again, then you're gonna there may be a problem with it. I call them the aggravators anyway, not the, the aggravators, aggr not the aggregators. <laughs> that's right, that's well, you know, right. one right. of the things that also happens in campaigns is they're not just looking at polling; they're also looking at other data they're getting from people doing yeah. door knocking or field operations. They're looking at social media mentions. Absolutely. I mean, they've got a variety of indicators and focus groups and Absolutely. focus groups Absolutely. that are telling them things about what's happening. And the cost. Right? And we felt gotten, that in yeah. 2016. Yeah. You know, we, we, I sat in focus groups and heard young. 24, 23 year old black voters tell me super, I mean, super predator, super predator. And I'm thinking, you weren't a lot, you don't remember that. Yeah, yeah. Right? And those rumblings from, the, from, from that qualitative, from those focus groups, were really speaking to what we saw end up happening on election day. That that splintering of that Obama coalition, those young voters that splintered in 13 and 14 percent of them voted mm -hmm. third party, that was the margin of, that was the margin of, of, of the margin of difference. Yeah. Well, you know, even in the Democratic primary, there are a lot of people in 2016 who kept saying, oh, well, Bernie's going to, you know, he doesn't really matter. This is Hillary's race to win. But we were doing research on a variety of other projects. And, you know, you would do a conversation with voters about Democratic Party values or whatever it was, and you'd get back in that thing, oh, that sounds like Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. right? So people were already making associations with Bernie Sanders very early that you weren't hearing yeah. about in the national. And, and I think we're going to see more mm -hmm. focus groups because the good scientific quality polling is getting more and more expensive, and it's harder to, to do. And so I think we're seeing some junk polls, and then we're going to see focus groups because I think that's going to provide some insight I I into what's going on. Okay, I have a question for you guys. It's real time. We are seeing impeachment play out right now, mm -hmm. right? And we're looking at these polls. You guys are doing some. We're looking at these polls, and we're seeing basically a split down the middle of the country. Yeah. I have a little suspicion that this impeachment um, cauldron is going to be is the, is the closest approximator we're going to get to next mm -hmm. November. Mm -hmm. Because right now, when you ask people a head-to-head -head question, they're like, oh, Donald Trump versus my idea of whatever these people are, I don't know That's that much. Right. They're kind of thinking about this in a fantastic or philosophical way about who they'd vote for. But when you're asking people right now to make a choice, do you keep Donald Trump or not That's keep right. Donald Trump, we're seeing that split right down the middle. Yeah, and it's all about right now it's going to, I should say, down the road, it's going to be about mobilization, not persuasion, because we're not seeing anybody right. switching around here. We're seeing who's going to really get their folks out. And obviously, right now, for the Democrats, they don't have a candidate. So you're sort of, I might like Bernie Sanders, but then just Michael Bloomberg. That's so, exactly you know, right. and so, so you're not going to get that real enthusiasm because I have other choices. That's so, right. Terrence, somebody told me yesterday that, in fact, this is the new swing voter in this election might not be somebody who switches between Trump and Biden or Warren or, or Sanders. It's somebody who decides to vote for their candidate or stay home. That's exactly right. And that's, I mean, that, that, that is, this, this is the swing voter of this, of this cycle, right, is, is our ability to mobilize that voter that, is, that, really, that really doesn't have a, a true horse in this race, that, is, that does not have an ideological uh, uh, attachment 
to either side, but it's, it's instead looking at who's going to provide the best life for them in their community. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a question that I think both sides still have to answer. Yeah, absolutely. It se that seems like it's been answered, right, but by, by Donald Trump's... But uh, are Democrats... Uh, but, 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 but this is interesting, though, because it feels like, feels like Democrats, many Democrats, maybe in the more establishment media and maybe in some of the bigger campaigns, are thinking that there is some group of voters out there that voted for Donald Trump in Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, who they can get to vote for a Democrat in next November in 2020, I, I just I, I, do you I, I, see those voters. In I, your I, research? I, I think persuade. I think I think that the persuadable vote is shrinking every day. Uh, and, and we and to your point, we see that in the in the impeachment numbers, not in the in the in the, in, in the impeachment numbers, not moving very much at all. But I, I do think that there is a swing voter that that voted third party in Wisconsin mm. and in Pennsylvania. That is a younger voter. That is that is that is that is, that is not a, a a a registered Democrat or a registered Republican, but does need to be persuaded to get into this. Yeah. To get into this race. And to our earlier discussion about the Democratic primary field, there's a place where people have not made up their minds. So yeah. the, the toss up, the horse race polls are showing, you know, this one with this, this one with that. But when you ask people, have you made up your mind yet? Right. You know, 60, 70, 80 percent say no. So wait, we're going to see potential for lots of movement there. So and that's is there, the volatility. And is there any other volatility here when we look at young voters? Because we've got Generation Z voters coming online every day as that's they right. turn 18 yeah. uh, who never voted before. Yeah. So it's hard to know what they would have done four years ago because they didn't vote four we years could, ago. But we could also look at, at look at what happened four years ago. And and Donald Trump won voters that that that, that became voters between, between 18 and 22 that became eligible yeah. since 2012. Wait. He won those voters. Yeah, so that is a swing voter right there yeah. that Democrats really should be paying attention to because that's should, that's the sweet that, that's the sweet spot and they're losing them. Yeah. Right. One thing I want to extinguish though, and this yes. came out of 2016, is the whole notion of a shy Trump voter. Yeah. Okay. That sort of came out like, oh well, the polls missed it because of these people wouldn't say they're for Trump. Trump voters are not shy. I mean, that's just like this kind of like this pollster cop out. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. And why would they be shy for the, the uh, state polls, but not for the national polls? Right. So you know, you can't be one way and not the other way. So we're going to hear about that if there's a little discrepancy. That's one that's not. Real. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push there a little bit because because 11 percent of black men voted for Donald Trump, and I haven't met one of them yet. So they're pretty shy. About, they're pretty shy about talking about it, and he's pursuing okay. that voter. With the he exception a, of that group, <laughs> the shy Trump voter, hey, very you, hard to find. Harris has been here before talking about this group of African American yeah. men who that's could end up being a decision maker in some of these close states. Absolutely. And we got to keep our eye on this. We got to keep our you, eye on this. You it. tipped us to this, and we've been watching it ever that's since right. you were here. And he's making a play. He's making a sure play for those voters, and he doesn't need a lot. Uh, two or three percent is enough to, to, to tip the, squ the scales in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. All right, guys, thank you both for being here. It's a pleasure to have yep. you. Thanks for watching Hill TV on YouTube. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we post new videos. And head to thehill.com for all the latest political news.